Hi everyone, welcome to the RTX 4070 Ti buying guide, where we'll compare which models have better coolers, VRMs, and power limits. As usual, all the RTX 4070 Ti's will perform pretty similarly at default, except for the more extreme cards when overclocked. But you should always pick the best card for the price you're willing to spend. So even if you just want the cheapest RTX 4070 Ti, I'm pretty sure there's a few models that are at the same price and therefore you can pick the best one in that price bracket. In the previous generation, power limits were very important, as that makes the biggest impact on GPU performance. For the RTX 40 series GPUs, however, this is no longer the case. The RTX 40 series cards are now made in TSMC's super-efficient 5nm process that's much more efficient than the previous Samsung 8nm process. All the while, Nvidia is still increasing the power limits. This means that these new GPUs are much less restricted by the power consumption, which means they really just boost higher without constantly hitting the power limiter. This also means that the manufacturers can't easily boost performance by just putting a higher power limit, like in the previous generation, as there is really no point in increasing power limits if they aren't causing any throttling in the first place. Similar things can be said about the cooling solutions on these new GPUs as it seems like the side effect of Nvidia specifying a high power limit by default meant that all the manufacturers designed massive coolers really expecting the GPUs to redline the power limit like in the previous generation. While the reality is, the RTX 40 series GPUs rarely max out their power limits. Yes, even the RTX 4090 doesn't really consume the whole 450 watt TDP. This means that there is practically no graphics card model out there that has a bad cooler in this generation. Because these new GPUs are much more efficient, they also don't need as powerful a VRM as the previous GPUs. But a powerful VRM is still important to enthusiasts that intend to overclock or undervolt. Not only because a stronger VRM can supply more power to an overclocked GPU, but also because the weaker VRMs are almost always a result of cost cutting which means that there are less capacitors being used that results in noisier voltage output that will result in less clock speed at the same voltage, or other cost-cutting measures that just results in worse power and voltage regulation for the graphics card. The bottom line is, there's no excuse for putting weak VRMs on high-end graphics cards that cost more than ever before. Which is why there's good news for the RTX 4070 Ti. Sure, it's not as overkill as the RTX 4080 and some of the 4090 designs, but the minimum NVIDIA reference specification for the VRMs is a 9 phase by 50 amp VRM totaling 450 amp for the cores and 2 phase by 50 amp totaling 100 amps for the memory. This is already more than enough for any RTX 4070 Ti running their out of the box speeds. The GPU runs at 1.1 volt by default, which is higher than the 4080 and 4090, and at its 285 watt power limit, that is only 260 amps of current at most which means that even the weakest VRMs, you'd have to almost double the power consumption of the RTX 4070 Ti to even start worrying about blown VRMs. Basically, you could do extreme overclocking and shunt mod any RTX 4070 Ti to give it unlimited power, and none of them would blow up. All the VRMs are pretty capable. If you volt mod it and raise the power consumption in liquid nitrogen extreme overclocking, only then you'd need to watch out for maxing out the VRMs. But if you're a regular overclocker who just overclocks in software for daily driving, basically all the VRMs are completely fine. So VRMs should be the least of anyone's concern when buying an RTX 4070 Ti. It should really only be a concern in a situation when you're comparing two different cards with similar cooling and power limits, then there's no reason not to buy the card with the better VRMs but otherwise it should not be the main contributing factor. I do think it is nice to have a card with a 600 amp and higher VRM for peace of mind when overclocking because I like to shunt mod and it's not really necessary for most users but it's just nice for myself and others who might think the same as me. Although one thing is that Zotac has seemed to absolutely gone insane and literally use the same PCB and VRM as their RTX 4080 and 4090 cards on their 4070 Ti Amp Extreme. Which looks amazing on the surface because you have such a powerful VRM, but um, it does seem to cause the RTX 4070 Ti to have a very high idle power draw. It's actually higher than the 4080s and even some of the 4090s. It could be fixable in firmware, but my guess is that the sheer number of VRM phases makes it really inefficient at low loads. So 
maybe putting a much too overkill VRM is not really the way to go here. The only real standout here is the ASUS Trix, which does have a digital MPS2888A voltage controller that has an I2C interface that you can solder an external controller like the Elmore EVC2SX. And this allows you to control the voltages manually, which is especially useful for extreme overclocking, but otherwise for most people, this is not really a huge advantage. Similarly for power limits, the default 285 watt power limit is already plenty for the RTX 4070 Ti to sustain their maximum boost clocks at default, which means the maximum power limits are only the important values here, as that allows enthusiasts who want to overclock these cards chase that final few points in benchmarks. I think it is pretty black and white what cards overclockers should choose if it's just based on power limits. Just get the cards with a 365 watt or higher power limit and you should have more than enough to max out an RTX 4070 Ti. Realistically, the 330 to 340 watt cards should also be plenty for overclocking as well and you could always just shunt mod to give it unlimited power, but it's just nice to have a card with already a high power limit so you don't actually have to do any hardware mods. Now for the cards below 330 watts, I really don't understand why they're set that low. The 12VH power connector can supply up to 450 watts on most 4070 Ti's using, uh, I think, three power connectors, and the VRMs literally cannot explode if you try, so I don't see why they don't just let people have 365 watts power limit for all the cards, because there's really no disadvantage in my opinion. Now for the cooling performance of the different cards, it is impossible to find performance results on every model as not every one of them gets reviewed. But I did gather the performance results measured by Tech Power Up and Kid Guru to combine them to a really large result that can be used to compare the cards. I combined the results by correcting the temperatures to Tech Power Up's results by calculating the average delta temperature and noise measured on the same cards that Tech Power Up tested and applying a correction to any card that isn't tested by Tech Power Up to be able to be added in the same graph. The result is this combined graph, which isn't completely accurate by any means, but it is good enough to give an idea of how these cards stack up. Due to popular demand, I have also added data for the card's quiet bias in addition to only using the performance bias results like I usually do. First, let's sort by temperature, where you can immediately tell the Gigabyte Gaming OC performs incredibly well. Using its performance BIOS, it can keep the GPU at below 60 degrees Celsius, no doubt helped by the fact that it's the only RTX 4070 Ti with a vapor chamber. However, the PNY Virtu Epic X can run quieter than the Gigabyte Gaming OC on its quiet BIOS while keeping the same temperatures, which is extremely impressive as it does not have a vapor chamber and does not have more heat pipes than the Gigabyte card. My guess is that its fan design is just superior to the other cards, as it looks like the fan geometry is similar to the high-performance fans that got released recently. Even the impressive MSI Supreme X that has 500 grams more mass cannot beat the PNY card. Also surprising to me are the Palette Gaming Pro and Inno 3D iChill X3 that perform similarly to the Supreme X. The MSI Gaming X Trio and Asus Tough OC instead seems to be slightly behind, though not as bad as the Zotac Amp Extreme card. The Zotac card is way too noisy for the temperatures that it runs, especially on its performance BIOS, and if you use its quiet BIOS then it just becomes the third hottest RTX 4070 Ti while being nowhere near the quietest, so their cooler is just not that great. Sorting by noise, if you want the quietest RTX 4070 Ti, the MSI cards do have BIOSes that go really low in the fan RPMs using their quiet BIOS, but I would say the PNY is much better as it can be just as quiet with much lower temperatures. For the other cards that don't have reviews yet, here's the tier list that I came up with. As per usual, this isn't 100% accurate as it's really just my estimation from seeing the cards that were reviewed and comparing them to how the coolers of these other non-reviewed cards are built. This should still be accurate enough that the cards in the same tier will perform similarly in terms of cooler performance. There is no particular order inside the tiers themselves aside from alphabetical order. In the SS tier, there is only colorful Neptune here, which by nature of being water-cooled will always have an advantage over the air-cooled cards, although I don't really see a point of water-cooling these cards, as the S tier air-cooled cards are so good already. The Asus Strix, Colorful Vulcan, Gainward cards, Gigabyte cards, MSI Supreme X, and the Pallet cards, and the, also the PNY Virto Epic X, all have overkill coolers for the RTX 4070 Ti. 
Yes, all the Gigabyte cards are in the S tier as you can see, because they all have the same massive cooler with a vapor chamber, which is really cool. Though, the PNY Virtu Epic X might be the best outright due to its low noise and low temperature combination. So if you want the best cooling cards, then just get the PNY Epic X, not the regular Virto, because that has a different cooler. Next down are the A tier cards, which are still very good performing coolers regardless, just slightly warmer and noisier than the S tier. Even the worst coolers are only in the B tier this time, as they all just seem to be oversized for a low power part like the RTX 4070 Ti. They're, these are mostly cheaper, more basic cards too, so I don't really see a problem with them having slightly worse cooler than the top cards. The only standout is the Zotac Amp Extreme Aero, which is, to me, incredibly bad for a flagship product. I mean, they have such a good VRM, but then their coolers are not that great. I'm still confused how Zotac always manages to create the worst performing cooler out of all the other similarly sized cards, so something with their fan design or their heat pipe design or something is causing them to underperform. Lastly, here is the overall tier list of all the cards. This is not in any particular order within the tiers again, except for alphabetical order, as there are more closely matched cards in this generation than ever before, which makes it really difficult to put one card over the other for the whole stack of different models. If any manufacturer disagrees with this list, please contact me and convince me why your card should be hired by probably sending me a review sample so I can actually see it for myself. Otherwise, I am very confident in the tiers that I place these cards at. The point of this tier list is to buy as high tier cards as possible in the budget that you are spending. Buy a higher tier card if it's the same price as a lower tier card that you are looking at. The only real SS tier card here is the Asus Strix. I only put cards that go above and beyond what you would consider perfect in the SS tier. And here the Asus Strix definitely delivers with its massively overkill VRM, great cooler design and the highest power limiter. Oh and even with the overkill VRMs, it doesn't seem to have a really high idle power draw like the Zotac card. On top of that, it's the only one that has a digital voltage controller with an I2C interface that you can solder an external voltage controller which makes it ideal for extreme overclocking as you can increase the voltage and really push some power through the card, which is great for LN2 overclocking for example, or just pushing more clock speeds even on air cooling. Now the next tier down is the S tier, which are still the cards that you could consider doing everything perfectly. So the Gigabyte Eorus cards, the MSI Supreme X, fits in the S tier due to their strong VRM and high power limit as well as a great cooler design. These are as good as a Strix for daily use, while overclocked even. Now the A tier cards are for cards that are still great in terms of cooler design and almost do everything perfectly but might have missed in one area or another. For example, the colorful Gainward and Pellet cards are impressive in their VRMs and cooler but they do not have the highest power limiters even though they could easily support it, which doesn't make sense to me. Then the Galax cards just do not have the same level of cooling performance as the S tier cards so it'll be in the A tier. While the Gigabyte cards have S tier vapor chamber coolers and high power limits, except that its VRMs are one of the weaker ones, so it should only be an A tier card. On the other hand, Inno3D finally put a stronger VRM than base level, so I can finally put their cards higher up in the list, such as in the A tier currently for their iGLX3. Next are the B tier cards, where either they don't have an S tier cooler or have two or more areas that they are lacking in. The Asus Tough, Colorful Advance, Galax, and MSI cards only have an A tier cooler and a low power limit, so they'll have to be in the B tier. Then the Gainward Phoenix and Pallet Gaming Pro on the other hand have S tier coolers but are lacking in VRMs and power limit. Now for the PNY Virto Epic X, it really should be at least an A tier card due to its extremely impressive S tier cooler, but they still insist on putting only a base level VRM and not allowing any power limit increase at all. Which is really disappointing to me because their card could easily have been in the S tier even if they just max out the PCB's VRMs and also let it use the maximum power limit. The Zotac Amp Extreme Aero is the exact opposite of the PNY card where it has the strongest VRM and also one of the highest power limits out of all the RTX 4070 Ti's, yet have a really mediocre B tier cooler. So if you could combine the PNY card and the Zotac card, then you'd have the best RTX 4070 Ti model, but unfortunately that's not a thing. 
Lastly, there are the C-tier cards, which are the cards that work good enough as an RTX 4070 Ti, but are not exceptional in any area. Although as I've said before, the coolers and the base level VRMs these cards use are already good enough. So in essence, there are no bad RTX 4070 Ti's that you should avoid. But yeah, you should still pick the cards that are the highest in the tier list whenever you're comparing between different models of a similar price range. While that about wraps it up for this buying guide, may you make the right purchasing decision and enjoy your RTX 4070 Ti. Leave a comment down below if you're mad that your RTX 4070 Ti is in low tier, although it's not really my fault, and also leave a like if I made you feel good about your RTX 4070 Ti purchase. As always, subscribe if you want to see more videos like this, and also, thanks for watching.